Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Well, welcome, Father. It's show number eight, eight. already. Uh-huh. We're doing, we're cruising right along. We yeah. uh, ended last show in, right here in St. Louis and talking about the De Pere River, the... Um, yeah. Cahokia and the Kaskaskians. What a beautiful yeah. show it was! And <laughs> sadly, we uh, we lost uh, father due to a, uh, a arrow in his yeah, arm. Yeah, yeah, that was but, a, the, well. It, it reminds us of the realities of of all of this. Yes. Um, actually, <laughs> I hate to tell you, after having such a wonderful, peaceful visit. <laughs> This program I, I've entitled "War," Uh-oh. <laughs> and and it's um, it's stepping out into the the world stage again. Okay. So we're going to take a look at that <clears throat> as we're entering into the seven into the eighteenth century. Okay, the seventeen hundreds. As we're entering into the eighteenth century, there are just a whole series of wars that take place and they're place and they're mainly between Britain and France and Spain, and sometimes the Netherlands, sometimes Austria, sometimes Prussia, sometimes Russia, you know, and and over in Europe. It's just a whole series. I remember as a graduate student having to memorize all of the wars, who's on what side when, because I was switching sides, and then what peace treaty ended that war, you know, and and that that was quite quite a task. Over here in America, when you study American history, those European wars take on a, a much simpler set of names and they're named after whoever the king or queen of England was at the time. Okay. So that it actually makes it a little bit easier for us. All we have to do is memorize the, um, the uh, British uh, monarchy. And then, <laughs> so, um, and, and so the first one that really strikes us here in America is, uh, is King William's war. Okay. And it starts in 1689 and goes to 1697. So it's around this same time that um, that we've just been talking about here, right. you know. So here we had the peaceable kingdom, you know, <laughs> on on and on the banks of the river uh, River de Pere. Um But here, there, they had uh, in Europe, they had this uh, horrendous war going on, and when that finally comes to an end, uh, there's. Uh, it's sort of inconclusive. Not a lot happens as a result. Okay, um, but the next war that comes along is going to have uh, serious consequences, especially for the French in uh, in in North America. And it's started by the French themselves. Okay. It started by King Louis the Philip. Uh, it's called the War of the Spanish Succession. Mm-hmm. because he's trying to get one of his relatives on the throne of Spain. Okay. And uh, there's there's always this contest between the Bourbons and the Habsburgs, and there's part of that contest there. Here in America, we call it uh, Queen Anne's War. Okay. Okay, and it goes on from 1702 to uh, 1714. Wow, that's a long time. Okay. It is, and and um, by the time it came to an end. Both the French and the and the British had spent so much money on this war that they were just exhausted, and so when the Treaty of Utrecht was was finally signed, and and brought um, uh, brought the war to an end, there was a big uh, a property trade, and the French I don't know if they realized the mistake they just made, but what they did was they gave away Hudson Bay and Newfoundland. Okay. Okay. Now, you know, if you look at it from the French point of view, it's frozen over half the year. It's, you know, what, you know, what, what do you have up there anyway? Some fishing and, and all that. And um and, and then there's one area that that uh, the the French are settled in. It's it's called Acadia. <clears throat> But these these people, the Acadians, were just sold down the river by by the for the French, so they became subjects of of the uh, British. Mm-hmm. These are French Canadians now are subjects of the British, and um, and the British. The first thing they do is they turned around and they called it New Scotland, Nova Scotia. Okay. Oh my gosh! Okay, okay. and then uh, it didn't take long before the British did not trust these French Canadians, uh, and so what they did was they they expelled. The entire group, they put. There were four thousand people living in that area, 
and they they put them on ships. I mean, they, they could have exterminated them; it would have been worse. But right. they put them on ships and they sent them to Louisiana. Oh my they gosh! They just dumped them from Nova Scotia to Louisiana. Louisiana, yeah. There is a life change. Oh yeah. Well, it took a little while for them to get used to the new climate mm-hmm. and the new new culinary. Right. <laughs> um, but the Acadians today we call Cajuns. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh! And that's other, that's where that's they, where it's that's from. where they came. That's why yeah, you have all this this French influence. Not just New Orleans, but right. you also have um, now that's a Creole uh, uh-huh. influence uh-huh. in New Orleans. But the Cajun influence in New Orleans that's the Acadians, and they get dumped there. They they learn the best they can. They they make their way the best they can. Do you know what the pop? That was okay. There were four thousand of them. Okay, in the early seventeen hundreds. Do you know what the population of the Cajuns are today? What? I have no idea. Half million. Oh my gosh! <laughs> From four four thousand to five hundred thousand today. Well, they prospered. That's the power of Tabasco sauce. <laughs> 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 they always say those hot things are good for what? Good for your heart, isn't it? <laughs> Evidently, so there there we have it. Um, these wars, I mean, on a more serious note, these wars were very disruptive, mm-hmm. uh, certainly for the French. Uh, they were also disruptive for uh, Indian relations throughout all of North America. Uh, the various Indian nations and the confederations found themselves really driven to si- side with one side or the other, with the French or with the English. And, um, and, and by and large, uh, when you looked at it, the the British found allies in the Iroquois and the Fox. Those would be the two allies. That the, and they'll have some others also from time to time. But those are the two nations that are going to be pretty pro-British. The French, on the other hand, are going to um, have uh, allies among the Hurons, uh, the Illinois people, uh, the Potawatomi and the other uh, Great Lake, uh, Great Lakes Algonquins. Oh, mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, so you know, there's that. Right. Uh, we've already seen the heavy-handedness of the Iroquois making raids all the way into Illinois. Remember, they're the ones that come in and, and destroy uh, uh, Fort Crivecourt and, right. and, and all. So, um, you know, we, we, we've seen this already, and we've seen that many of the Illinois people, in order to survive, have moved west of the Mississippi mm-hmm. and sought the uh, protection of the Osage and the Missouri Indians. <clears throat> but the French also um, had, had their hands full with, um, with, with especially the... Uh, the fox, okay, and, and the fox are going to be. They're located around the Green Bay area. Okay, okay. Uh, they're known as the Renards, uh, which is French for fox, you know. But oh. um, anyway, that's that's hmm. because of where they were. The fox, although they were not a large nation, had a pretty exalted notion of who they were and who they could be. <laughs> and the reason was is they were positioned. If you imagine that Green Bay area, further west. The nation that was living further west was the Sioux. Oh, okay. okay? Mm -hmm. And this is a very large um, nation, and they do a lot of fur trading and fur trapping, okay? Mm -hmm. Then uh, then, uh, that's to the west of the fox. To the east of the fox are the French. And the French want those furs, and they also have manufactured goods that the Sioux want. And so the fox in the middle think to themselves, hey, we'll be the middleman. <laughs> we'll control the trade mm-hmm. uh, between these two uh, these two g- uh, groups. Well, um, so it, it's a it's a very delicate relationship between all of these various Indian tribes and, uh, and and the French. The French have already lost out on the far east coast. They still contain, they still um, uh, maintain their uh, their presence at, in Quebec and Montreal and the, the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway. Okay, but they've just been squeezed and they don't even realize it because south of them is are the 13 British colonies. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right? North of them now is Hudson Bay and Nova Scotia. 
So in a sense, they're in the middle of a pincer and they don't even realize it. And they're still playing uh, games, trying to make things happen. One of the governors uh, went so far as to invite all of the Indian nations in the, in the St. Lawrence Seaway area, that's including uh, northern New York, therefore the Iroquois, and all of the others to come to Montreal and to um, uh, for a peace treaty. Okay. Okay. This was in 1701. And ultimately, the intention was to set up a uh, an, another fort to meet at a, at a different fort a little bit further down um which was termed fort um fort Pontchartrain. okay okay huh. that seems to be a popular name with um, among the, the french but the 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 point that's really important here is that the as it's des- described where that fort Pontchartrain is in french it says du trois de lac Herri et heron Okay, at the Straits of the Lakes of Erie and Here. Huron. Uh-huh. Okay, du Detroit, Detroit, English Detroit. Oh. That's where the city of Detroit ends up oh, becoming. Okay. Okay. It's <laughs> it's a fort that's uh, built with uh, some fifty soldiers. Uh, are assigned there along with some other 50 families uh, who are, uh, th- these are not military, they're, they're there for farming and trading and, and, and all of that. Uh, they also, that fort now attracts uh, several Indian nations who send uh, people to live there too. The Ottawa, the Hurons, and the Potawatomi are there also. But it turns out that this governor's idea uh, of of this this overarching peace parlay mm-hmm. gathering was not such a good idea after all because the fact is that while each of these Indian nations were allies to the French except for the Iroquois which were open to the possibility okay they were not at peace with each other and you know one of the uh, one of the sub themes of of all of this time period is constant uh warfare between these various nations and um and and, and sometimes it's just little raids and uh, you know sometimes it's a a couple guys getting murdered while they were out hunting other times it's it's really pitched battles and um and and so unfortunately a lot of those old rivalries were um were reborn uh from from that that attempt well once the queen anne war uh gets underway all diplomacy falls apart the iroquois once again went over to the british side and and then uh then there's this great fear now that the st lawrence river itself is going to be invaded by the british and the british have a plan to send a navy a fleet to the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. And now that's going to be really bad. We're talking about the, um, the uh, Jean-Baptiste Colbert's croissant. Okay? Uh-huh. That's the northern tip of that, that crescent. And, um, and, and so it, with this, then, the French call upon their Indian allies to come to their aid. And they do. Um, but luckily for the French, the the fleet is um, is hit by a terrible storm, and several ships are lost at sea, and the others are scattered, and so the invasion uh, doesn't take place after all. Okay. So um, the the downside of all of this is that it's driven the Iroquois into the hands of the um, of the British. And it has also caused the fox to go rogue. Oh, okay. And they just start acting out on their own. And they're, they are raiding French settlements all over the upper Mississippi. And not only that, but also the Potawatomi. Uh, they, they begin attacking the Potawatomi villages all throughout Wisconsin. And then the word comes that they are intent on attacking now the fort at Detroit. The fox are going to, they, they're, I mean, these guys have really got a high notion of themselves now, and they're going to go and attack Detroit, and they've made arrangements that the Iroquois will come and attack from the other side. And they're okay. going to, that's their intention, is to slaughter uh, Detroit. Well, what happens is that um, the French then are warned by the Potawatomi, 
because it, it, the Fox tend to uh, they tend to brag Float a lot, a little, <laughs> yeah, and they're boasting. Oh, you, you watch, see what we're going to do to you guys. You know, okay. Well, anyway, the Potawatomi let them know that, and so the French then secured the fort. Got it ready for the for the siege that was to come. So when the fox showed up, they uh, they were a little surprised to find that there were six hundred French and Indians that were there to defend Detroit. I mean, this these were Indians from the from Illinois. These were Canadian volunteers. Uh, everybody, and so uh, it it turns out that it's uh, not quite the uh, the happy little occasion. Not the show that the they were expecting. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> and so they 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 besieged Detroit. And then, much to their chagrin, they found out that as other nations arrived, the, the Ottawa, the Huron, more Potawatomi, they came in and they surrounded the fox. So think about this as a set of concentric circles. You've got the fort itself, right? Uh-huh. And it's surrounded by the fox uh, attackers. But then the fox attackers are surrounded by Indians that are friendly to the French. And now they found themselves, they're squeezed. They're in the middle. They're in the middle. <laughs> This siege, counter-siege, lasted for 20 days. Oh, my God. Oh, Lord. And finally, um, there was a terrible uh, thunderstorm one night, and the fox uses an opportunity to slip through the lines and to, to get away. So the siege came to an end, and everyone counted their losses. The French and the Indian allies lost 60 men. Wow. 60 soldiers and warriors. The fox lost 250. Wow. Okay. And along with that, they also um, lost 750 women and children who, when the battle came to an end, the fox had brought their women and children with them. When the warriors ran off, the other Indian nations came in and took vengeance on the women and children and killed 750 wow. before they could be stopped. This was devastating, and in the end, the fox were left with only about 100 surviving warriors, and these went north, uh, back up to the fox nation, and there they found another 400. So now at this point, the entire fox nation only has about 500 warriors in it. Wow. And uh, so this this was in 1712. Okay. Wow. 1713. The French sent troops up to punish what was left of the Fox Nation, and they had around two. They had 225 French soldiers. Okay, added to that some 200 volunteers. Okay, okay. remember the Fox have about 500, 500. warriors. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you've got that. That's 400 and. 25 French, mm-hmm. but they also got with them some 600 um, Indian allied braves. Okay. So they, they, they've got the, the preponderance of numbers so there. Their numbers are greater. Yeah. They chased the fox all the way up to Oshkosh. Okay. And there, um, the the fox had set themselves up a fortress, and uh, they're well fortified, and the French uh, could could not get in. There were several attacks, but they couldn't overwhelm. And ultimately, uh, there was negotiations, peace negotiations, and the French agreed to allow the fox to leave, um, and uh, and... So, which they and, and they would be given free passage, okay, okay so safe passage. They could leave safely, right? And so, as soon as the fox warriors got away, they then denounced the treaty and went back on the war path again. So now it wasn't safe again for the French anywhere over in that whole area, that whole region of Wisconsin and Illinois, and 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 all of that. It was all very dangerous. In fact, the whole, if you could imagine, the Illinois River, it was no longer safe for a French or a French allied Indian to even canoe along the Illinois River. The Fox were making raids, in and. Um, and, and they were so violent, and that area was so violent that even the Peoria people left. Wow. And they, and they moved to Cahokia. Wow. To get away from them. Now, uh, to make matters worse, uh, 
<laughs> the jurisdiction of the Illinois Territory, which had been under the control of Quebec. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. And I'm talking. I'm talking governmental control here, not just um, uh, diocesan. Spiritual. Uh-huh. Right. But now that's been shifted, and in 1717, the jurisdiction now goes to what is now Mobile, Alabama. Okay. Okay. And so what we're seeing then is the French croissant. Remember, this is that, that great crescent that starts up in Quebec, goes mm-hmm. all the way to the St. Lawrence River, the Great Lakes, down to the Illinois River, down to the Mississippi River, all the way down to New Orleans. Mm-hmm. Okay, That's all beginning to break up. It, it's been cracked into two parts, and Illinois is the fracture point, mm-hmm. Be- and because of this, these all these, um, these um, Indian raids right. of the fox, you know. So... <clears throat> At the same time that that's happening, also pelt prices skyrocket, which gives the fox even more negotiating room. You know, sure. um, it's not yeah. safe to travel anymore. So. Yeah, that's right. It's not safe to travel, so you can't be uh, bringing your pelts mm-hmm. around unless you're going to do it under the auspices of the fox, and they're going to take their own percentage out mm-hmm. of all of that. Um, one of the things they also discovered, much to the chagrin of the French uh, royal. Um, um, uh, officials is that the warehouses that they had built I mean there's a whole series of warehouses that they had built uh, for these pelts right well it turns out they didn't do a very good job at it and so the pelts were actually rotting oh, no. in the warehouses which of course set the price skyrocketing even higher mm-hmm. you know so uh, yeah the whole idea behind this and this is a really interesting one is that you're going to go ahead, and all throughout the West, you're going to have all of this trapping that'll go on and hunting that'll go on, and then the the pelts will be um, um, they'll, they'll be processed uh, there out in in the field, and then uh, they're going to be dried and then brought together. Various trappers and traders are going to bring them together, and the whole idea was to center them in what becomes the city of Peoria. Uh-huh. Okay, and then so and and Peoria is like the, the the linchpin of the whole French Crescent. Right. Okay, and then at, what's going to happen then is that they'll be shipped either north up to um, Quebec mm-hmm. and then over to Europe, or they're going to be shipped south down the Illinois, the Mississippi, down to New Orleans, and then from there. Uh, loaded onto uh, ocean-going ships and then sent over to Europe that way. Okay. And that's going to feed the appetite that the Europeans have for American fur. Fur. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, unfortunately, uh, you know, the uh, the whole system broke down because the warehouses were not good enough, mm-hmm. and so it becomes much, much more expensive with... Uh, with uh, these these pelts, this further emboldens the um, the fox, as you can well imagine. Mm-hmm. They made one big bad mistake, and that was on the 31st of May, 1722, they attacked a canoe that was making its way between Cahokia and a new fort, uh, uh, the Fort de Chartres. Uh-huh. Okay, and on board was a young officer by the name of Louis Saint Ange de Belrive. <laughs> okay. He's going to play a very important role in uh, in the founding of of St. Louis and its early administration. Mm-hmm. But he survived that report uh, that that attack, and then later um, goes down to. Um, uh, down to um, Fort de Chartres, where he's then sent back up to Cahokia with a force of six men to defend Cahokia against these fox. Oh, okay. Doesn't look good. He gets a company of, of volunteers to help out. Doesn't look good. So he arrives there. He's at Cahokia. He has 17 men to, to stave off this attack. And um, he got get, gets he doesn't speak the language, by the way. So he gets a hold of a priest who is able to interpret for him. And he tells the Indians that are in that area, around Cahokia, he said, okay, I've got my 17 men here, but we've got a huge army that's coming up from Fort de Chartres. It's going to be helping you guys. We need your help right now. And all of these Indians then... Um, they, they go ahead and, and they rally around him, and word gets out all over the place. Boy, this big French army is coming up the river. The fox run in the other direction. 
There wasn't anybody. There, was, <laughs> there, there were 17 people. It was all, all a bluff. It was all bluff. a bluff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. Nonetheless, these wars continue. Um, eventually, at one point, the Fox still are raiding. At one point, they actually kill off 17 Illinois in uh, while they were parlaying, while they were negotiating with the Fox. The Fox tricked them and, and killed them. That did it. Mm-hmm. That was the summer of 1730. And with that, the whole Illinois nation put together a war party, and they went after the Fox. They hunted them down on a, a little rise uh, near Vermilion of the Vermilion River, and the French hurried to to join them too, and by the time they got there, there were fourteen hundred men. For on the not on Allied the French side. side, not the Fox side. That's on okay. the French, yeah, you know, on the French side, fourteen hundred. That's uh, a bit different than seventeen. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so this was something to deal with. Again, they put up a, a defensive fight. They lasted for eighteen days. Darn, another violent thunderstorm came. They slipped out again. Oh, no. Believe it or not, yeah. Oh, and they get several miles away from this 1,400-man army, and they're thinking, ah, we're pretty good. And all of a sudden, the, the French and the Indians show up right at their rear, uh, and they're following them. And um, they they are just slaughtered. Slaughtered, and it, the few that are left end up going to join up with the Sauk tribe, mm-hmm. and then moving to Iowa. They'll rebuild themselves. The Fox will come back, but it'll it'll be now be the the Fox and the Sauk. Okay. And we're going to see them later on because they're it's still going to be British allies, and during the War for American Independence, they're going to join up with the British and they're going to attack the. The city of St. Louis. Oh, my gosh. Those darn fox. <laughs> <laughs> they don't quit, do they? No. <laughs> Crafty little ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is war. You know, and this it, is war. There's a lot of stuff going on. When we look a little bit further south, um, we'll, we'll take a little uh, more of a look at, at, uh, at some of that. But also there are some nations in the south that are uh, pitching a fit to the, to the French. Um, the Chickasaw, for mm-hmm. one. Um, they are uh, they're allied to the Natchez. Uh-huh. The Natchez are allied to the British. The British are encouraging the Natchez to encourage the Chickasaw to cross over the river in what is now today Chickasaw Bluffs, Memphis, Tennessee, and to go into Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Remember that the Arkansas peoples, many of them have been converted. Remember that, right. you know, all that? Father, right. And, and, yeah, Thousands. Yeah. And, and they were very pro-French. And, uh, and so they're being encouraged to go into Arkansas to kill or kidnap the people there, either the French or the Native Americans there, and to bring them back over to the other side of the river where they would be made slaves. Mm. You know? Um, one group uh, reacted against this and and joined in with the French. This is the the Choctaw oh. peoples, and and they end up um, uh, siding with with the French. The French decide that they're going to intimidate the uh, the Natchez people, and what they did was they built a fort right near their own village, you know, and. Uh, and that would have been nice, except that the that the French now were their very presence there taunted the the Natchez, who rose up and on November twenty eighth of seventeen twenty nine, attacked that that fort. They killed everybody except a few women and a few black slaves. Everyone else was slaughtered there, and so now the French found themselves in a situation where they had to. Go to war now in the South. Oh, my gosh. So uh, this is just tough. Oh, this is sad. It is sad. It is sad. Because they were all, had been, you know. I know. (laughs) Functioning so well together. (laughs) Can't we all play nicely? (laughs) Well, evidently not. Apparently not. Oh, my goodness. So next time around when we come back, we're going to see how the French attempt to subdue the southern pro-British uh, Indians, and they really bungle it bad. Oh, no. And uh, it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to end well, well have for some French. more not pretty. Okay. Yeah. Well, Father, thank you. And, uh, gosh, it is, I love hearing all these, these names, though, of these tribes. And, yeah. 
and uh, yeah. the Choctaw. Growing up, I, I recognize those That's, those names. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. all right. Well, can we uh, close with prayer and your blessing? Oh, okay. Glory yeah. be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was as in, in the beginning, beginning is, is now, now, and ever shall be. be. World, World without, without end. end. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.